Hello, Hot Mess Historians. Welcome back. We're going to talk about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. The USS Indianapolis was a premier ship in the US fleet during World War II. It earned 10 battle stars, which means that it saw combat and participated in all 10 of the major naval battles in the Pacific Theater during World War II. The day before the invasion of Okinawa, the USS Indianapolis was doing a bombardment of the shore in preparation for the land attack that was going to take place the following day. While they are performing this bombardment, they are hit by a kamikaze plane. In case you didn't know, so the kamikazes were these Japanese planes that were manned by one pilot. They were loaded with explosive and the goal was not to drop the explosive on the ship or on land. The goal was to dive the plane directly into the ship, blowing up the pilot, the airplane, and the ship all together. So suicide mission. The USS Indianapolis is hit by a kamikaze plane and it goes through all of the decks of the ship, causing extreme damage. Nine men died and approximately 30 were wounded in this attack. The vessel itself was critically damaged and they were ordered to make way back to port in San Francisco. While in dry dock, they received top secret covert orders. They were to carry cargo from San Francisco to the island of Tinian. No one on board the ship, not even Captain Charles McVeigh, who was the captain of the USS Indianapolis, this premier ship knows what is in this cargo. Now, Sailors are gonna talk, gossip, and speculate as to what it is. And by far the best rumor that I have heard that was speculated that they were transporting 20,000 rolls of scented toilet paper for General Douglas. The actual truth we know now is they were transporting the components for the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The ship arrives in Tinian with its top secret cargo and offloads on July 26th 1945. The plan is that once they've offloaded in Tinian, then they're going to make their way to Guam. They're going to resupply and head off for Leyte in the Philippines because they're going to join the fleet there in preparation for the invasion of Japan. So the evening of July 30th, 1945, the India is making its way from Guam to Leyte. And it's a very cloudy, evening, very low visibility. Another standard protocol and procedure is that when you're going through enemy waters, when you're going from point A to point B, you don't take a straight line because that kind of leaves you open for attack. What the standard protocol is that you zigzag your boat or your ship like this in the water. And that makes you a more difficult target when an enemy is trying to lock onto your location. Remember, radar's not really a thing at this time, so they figure low visibility, we're kind of in the shadows. Let's make up some time, forget the zigzagging that slows us down, and we're gonna go straight. About midnight, July 30th, there is an enemy submarine in the water. It is Japanese submarine I-58, and the commander of the I-58 fires a spread of six torpedoes at the Indy, two of which hit. Upon impact, many of the sailors have said that it was just sheer chaos. Everyone on board knows the ship is going down. Everyone's looking around knowing this This is not like it was in, in Okinawa. This is really, really, really bad. The problem is the damage from the torpedoes is so extensive that no word can be passed, no orders can be passed down from the captain. So nobody really knows what's going on. A lot of the junior sailors are looking to the officers and saying, can we start cutting down these life jackets? Like this is getting serious. And the officers are saying, we can't cut down those life jackets until we hear word from the captain to abandon ship. One survivor is quoted as saying, no word can be passed other than an oral word because all power, all communication, all electricity, you know, that's out. How are they gonna get the order from the captain if they have no means to communicate it? Another survivor says, they could have hollered abandoned ship and nobody would have heard. I mean, it was just chaos. Ultimately, men just decide to heck with this. We're gonna take matters into our own hands. They start cutting down life jackets, starting to let uh, life rafts out and just jumping in the water. They haven't heard abandoned ship, but they know that if they don't abandon the ship, they're going down with it. So men just start diving off the, uh, off the boat and into the water. 
and they're landing in these big puddles of diesel oil that's just floating on the ocean surface and they're landing on top of one another and that's causing injuries so if you were lucky enough not to get thrown into a wall if you were lucky enough not to get burned or cut on a piece of metal that may became dislodged on the ship you could be landed on top of or get this diesel oil in your mouth and your lungs and it's just agony i mean on top of the sheer terror of I am in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and my boat is sinking underneath me. The USS Indianapolis sinks. It goes completely underwater approximately 12 minutes after the first torpedo hits. That's it. It only takes 12 minutes. There were 1,196 souls on board when the torpedo hit. It's estimated between 860 and 900 men were able to dive into the ocean while the remaining 330 or so went down with the ship. Now, over the course of that 12 minutes of it sinking and you've got men jumping off constantly, the, the ship is still drifting along. Even though it's sinking, it's still drif drifting along for that 12 minutes. So you have men jumping off every now, you know, across that, that same route. So they're spread out. They're not all in one group. It is midnight, it, you, it's cloudy, you can't see anything. It's been reported from survivors that that first eight hours was just pandemonium, chaos, and fear. You were trying to find shipmates, you were calling out, you didn't know how far away they were, you didn't know if you were the only survivor. There's also the distinct fear that the enemy submarine is still there and is waiting to pick off survivors. Now, once daybreak happens, there's a little bit of calm, a little bit of a morale boost because they're able to see and they start consolidating their numbers. And ultimately they get these groups together throughout this route that are kind of surrounded by, by lifeboats and they're putting the most wounded on the boats themselves. A lot of these kids, and they were kids, they were very young. The average sailor, I wanna say, on board the Indy was between 19 and 22. So it's, it's a very young group. A lot of them didn't know how to swim and they had these life jackets and that's really the only thing that was keeping them afloat. They formed these groups and that lifts morale because you're not alone. You have your shipmates there. Uh, you're able to render aid to the best of your ability to those who are most severely wounded and kind of work your way back. And so there was hope that they would be able to, to console one another and, and really stick together. There was more hope given because one of the radio men from the Indy, when it went down, he was able to get off the ship and word was spreading from group to group that the radio man was saying, I know for a fact that I got the SOS out. They're gonna know we're out here, they're looking for us. I got it out. And worst case scenario, if the SOS wasn't successfully sent out, they're expected in Leyte on July 31st, the very next day. So when they don't check in and report, they don't come into port, they're going to know something happened. They'll be looking for us. It's okay. It's okay. They're sort of lending spirit to one another and saying, let's hang in there. We got this. So July 31st comes, second day in the water. The USS Indianapolis is due to pull into port at Leyte at estimated time of arrival, 1100, 11 a.m., July 31st. They don't show up naturally because now it's at the bottom of the Pacific. However, because the USS Indianapolis was a captain ship, they had the authority to change their orders, their plans at any time. The sailor who was on duty checking in arrivals and documenting that saw the Indy had not shown up, wrongfully assumed, I guess they just changed their plans, we'll take their name off the anticipated arrivals board and let's move on with our day. The next sailor comes on shift for his watch, does not see the Indy's name up on the arrivals board and assumes they arrived safely. I'm going to go about my watch. No one knows the USS Indianapolis is missing. So the men are spending the next, this is their second full day in the water. They're beginning to suffer the effects of dehydration. They are becoming sunburned. They have their original wounds that they would have gone into the water with, as well as uh, salt water lesions are beginning to, uh, to appear. So imagine sitting in a bathtub for an hour, your, your hands and you know, you're all wrinkly and, but imagine being in water 
in salt water for two days. So they're just, they're developing these sores on their skin. But that's not the worst thing that they're suffering. The survivors said that the water in the Pacific was so clear that they could see down a good 20, 30 feet, clear down, to the sharks swarming and swimming beneath their feet. The second day, the sharks start attacking and they're taking bites out of people. They're going after the most wounded, those that are bleeding. If you were isolated, if you weren't in one of those large groups, you were targeted by a shark pretty quickly. Um, or one survivor estimated in his group or in his general vicinity, they lost about 20 the first day to shark attacks. The next day was complete carnage. We're now on August 1st. 1945, third day in the water. Almost all survivor accounts say the third day was the hardest because they lost the most men. Not just to shark attacks. You have to remember at this point, they're on day three of little to no water. The only water supply they have, that drinkable water supply, excuse me, drinkable water supply that they have is when rain clouds would come overhead. Drop a few drops of rain, you'd have to cup your hands. One survivor, this is his account, cupping hands, hopefully catching some drops of water and trying to get it into their mouth. That's what they're surviving on. No food. What little food they had in the, in the life rafts, the spam, sharks took that. That's, they lured them away by throwing the spam. So they have no food. So they're suffering from dehydration more and more sunburns, the salt water lesions are getting worse, your original wounds, the dehydration is getting to a critical, and the exhaustion, dehydration and exhaustion is getting to a critical level. There are men who are giving up hope. They said, I can't do this anymore, I am so thirsty, and they begin to drink the ocean, the salt water. And drinking salt water in those large amounts is going to cause delusions, hallucinations, and one sailor is reported to have hallucinated and said, I see, a, I see an island, I'm gonna, I'm gonna swim to the island, come on guys, let's swim to the island, we, we're saved, we're saved, let's go. No one else, of course, sees the island, and so he decides, I'm gonna go for it. Starts swimming off to this island, he, only he can see, and he's picked off by a shark. And this is happening, not just one or two off men, happening over and 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 over all day and all night you have no way to escape it so day three August 1 is bad it's a bad day by nightfall August 1st the men are starting to say you know what no one knows we're here this is it they start giving up hope even those that were hanging on, hanging on, now that, that doubt is creeping in. Now over these, uh, each day, uh, I mean, you're in the Pacific, it's the middle of World War II, there are planes flying back and forth all day long, all day long. Never, the, the men are never spotted in the water. You have to remember, you're talking planes are what, 8,000 or so feet up in the air and you're trying to find somebody's head in the vast blue Pacific Ocean. But the sailors, the, the survivors said, we're gonna do everything we can to be seen. So each time they heard a plane coming, they'd flail their arms about, making waves, doing everything that they could to draw attention to their location. And each time they were disappointed. August 2nd, day number four in the water, four days now, a plane flies overhead. The sailors, the survivors begin flailing and yelling and hoping to draw attention to themselves. Lieutenant Chuck Gwen is flying a PV-1 at 8,000 feet and there is no reason why he should spot anything in the water and he sees him. The survivors call him their angel. He spotted them. He immediately radioed back for emergency backup at his location and a second plane comes in and that is Lieutenant Commander Adrian Marks and he is flying an amphibious plane which means that this plane is designed to land on water or on land and the standing order is do not ever under any circumstances land this plane in open ocean that's just how it's done you do not under any circumstances land 
that plane in open ocean. And Lieutenant Commander Marks said, bump that. And he landed in eight foot swells in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Survivors say it was the most beautiful landing they'd ever seen. In truth, it was a little bit rough. He would never be able to take off again. He had damaged the aircraft to the point that it could not take off. So basically, he's a sitting duck in the water. But he said, you know what? I have to do something. He lands his aircraft. It's still going. He's able to sort of putter around in a circle and gather up as many survivors as he can. Ultimately, he winds up picking up 56 survivors, bringing them on board to his plane, filling it to capacity, and then moving survivors out and laying them across the wing, strapping them down so they don't fall in the ocean. They're very, very weak, you have to remember, and strapping them down with parachutes until help and backup can come. The first ship to arrive the morning of August 3rd, early hours August 3rd, is the USS Cecil Doyle. And standard protocol, I know I've been talking about that a lot, but you have to remember it's wartime. So standard protocol, protocol at this time for these ships is extreme strict light discipline. That means that after sunset, no visible lights or as few visible lights possible need to be showing on deck. And that's a safety precaution because remember, radar is not a thing back then, not like it is today. And they want to avoid being detected by the enemy at all costs. So very, 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 very strict light discipline. Been happening for the entire war. We're talking four years now. When the USS Cecil Doyle pulls up to the location of where the survivors have been reported, the captain of the Cecil Doyle lit his big searchlight on the ship and pointed it directly into the sky. It was cloud cover. And so the clouds sort of helped spread that light out. And this is beyond a violation of regulation. And he said, I don't care these men have to see this light. Some may not be holding on. I have to do this to help them hold on. Survivor Woody Eugene James recalls seeing the Doyle arrive. About midnight, a little bit before, there was a light shining off the bottom of the cloud and we knew then that we were saved. That was the spotlight of the Cecil Doyle. The Navy is on the scene. There's a ship coming. You can't believe how happy we were. Guys screaming and yelling, we're saved, we're saved. The survivors were ultimately pulled out of the water by five different US ships and sent off to hospitals on three different islands. Out of the 860 to 900 men who went in the water on July 30th, only 317 of them survived. That's a pretty steep death toll. The atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, and it wasn't until the survivors, in when they were in the hospital, the radio cut through and let them know that the bomb had gone off and that the Japanese were surrendering on August 15th, that they knew what they were carrying. That's when the light bulb went off and said, that's what we were transporting. We helped in the war. Following the war, there's a massive investigation into the sinking of the USS Indianapolis and what happened on July 30th and the subsequent four days. Captain Charles McVeigh was indicted and brought under court martial on two counts. One, failure to order abandoned ship, and two, failure to zigzag. The entire crew of the Indy, all of the survivors are up in arms. They are furious that this is occurring. There is no reason in their minds, Captain McVeigh did absolutely everything that he was supposed to do. Captain McVeigh was one of the survivors that were pulled from the water, but he's famously remembered as telling those rescuers, take this person, take this person. He wanted to be the last one brought out of the water. He, did, he was the last one to request aid when they were on the ships. He wanted all of his men seen to. He was, by all accounts, an impeccable leader and an amazing captain. And all of his men felt that him being put under this court martial was just an absolute miscarriage of justice. And what they really think was going on, which, I mean, honestly, if you really look at all the facts, it, it, it holds water. The Navy wanted to draw attention to Captain McVeigh and put the blame on him for this tragedy. Honestly, is just a severely understated word for what has happened. 
but they want someone else to blame so that no one looks at the Navy and says, well, wait a second, why did it take so long for us to realize that they were gone? They were due back in port at July 31st, yet they were never reported missing. What's up with that? No, they don't want that to be brought to light. So they even go so far as to bring in the commander of the submarine I-58. They brought in the enemy combatant that sank his ship to testify. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. The commander of the I-58 testified that it did not matter if he ordered the zigzag formation. He could be going straight, he could be zigzagging, he could be going in a circle. The way I fired my shots, I was taking them down. It doesn't matter. What you're doing is wrong. But nobody listened. Ultimately, the charge of failure to order abandoned ship was dismissed because so many survivors testified that, like we said earlier, with you know, with the survivor saying it was just chaos. You could not, you could shout. That's all you could do. So that's understandable. They dismissed that charge. The zigzag, he's found guilty. He receives a demotion. It's a whole thing. He basically is living in shame. For years and years afterward, Captain McVeigh would receive hate mail from surviving family members of those that perished in the sinking. And this became too much for him. He could not cope any longer. And on November 6, 1968, Captain McVeigh took his own life. That did not stop the remaining survivors from fighting for justice for Captain McVeigh. They wanted his name cleared and they fought and fought with the Navy to have them clear his name and they refused to do so. Ultimately, they changed tactics and began to lobby Congress with the assistance, ironically, of a 12 or 13 year old boy from Pensacola, Florida. He was doing a school project on the sinking of the USS Indianapolis and it sparked interest in the community, the local community, and that spread and that spread and he got in touch with survivors and it began this huge lobbying campaign in DC. In October of 2000, Captain Charles McVeigh's name was cleared of any wrongdoing with the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. The exact location of the USS Indianapolis, of where it went down and where its final resting place was, remained unknown until August 19th, 2017. An expedition was sent out. They were searching for the USS Indianapolis. They had a few clues to go off of based on uh, Captain McVeigh's testimony, his records. Um, a lot of different pieces of intel went into that and they were able to locate its final resting place. And because of where it's located geographically, there's very little current from what I understand. There's a really great documentary that covers all of this. I'll put the link below. There are two great documentaries actually about this particular topic. But anyway, if you watch that, it's amazing. But the footage and the images reveal that the wreckage of USS Indianapolis appear almost untouched. After 72 years, locating the wreckage of this ship is, is not only important for history, um, it's not only important for us to finally get a visual and confirm what Captain McVeigh and even the commander of the I-58 were saying as far as where the torpedoes hit, but also survivors of the USS Indianapolis, those men, those 317 men that were pulled from the water. Many of them, their final wish is that when their time comes, they want to be laid to rest with their shipmates. They want to have their remains interned with the USS Indianapolis. And before, no one knew where that was. And now we can finally grant them their final request. Remember to stay tuned for a new and updated content. Try to post every Wednesday. And if you have a new topic that you want me to cover, leave it in the comments. I'll see what I can do.